As a review, we uh, covered the double helix structure of DNA with the sugar phosphate backbones with the nitrogenous bases towards the middle and the hydrogen bonding and C always pairing with G, always pairing with T. We talked about the purines and the pyrimidines. Uh, so all of that was covered last time. Then we looked at how DNA is packaged into chromosomes, starting out with the basic uh, structure of DNA, then wrapping around histones to form nucleosomes, and then we had the zigzag folding, and then irregular loops formed, and then with the help of other proteins, uh, coiling further to finally form a visible protein during uh, mitosis. So that mitotic chromosome there uh, is referencing the fact that you can see them, uh, but only during uh, mitosis. Then we looked a little bit more closely at the structure of the of the chromosome itself as it's coiled up uh, during mitosis. Each one of these is a sister chromatid. So this is chromatid and the chromatid. They're basically the exact uh, copies of DNA that were produced during the S phase of the cell cycle. This little constricted area where the two DNA are still connected is called the centromere. And then these protein plaques on the side of the kinetic core, which is the location where the spindle fiber uh, connects. And then we compared DNA and RNA. And uh, so this table reviews those, and you can find them in uh, this table in the notes for a quick review of the differences between them. Uh, these are the learning outcomes for section 4.2. Uh, we're going to go through them one at a time. As we get to each one, I will indicate what learning objective we are at. So looking at 4.2.1, learning objective here. Uh, here, we need to give a working definition for a gene. We've already defined gene before, and uh, this is very similar to that definition from before. Uh, one gene, one protein, basically. But uh, we do know that there are a lot more proteins than there are genes. The Genome Project found that there are uh, only about 20,000 genes, so uh, how can 20,000 genes make for millions of proteins or code for millions of proteins? So we had to modify our definition. It must be that a, this segment of DNA uh, then is actually can code for one or more proteins. So if we can take uh, one gene and use it to make many types of proteins, then that would match what we observe. Uh, remember that the DNA is made of a sort of an alphabet with the four nitrogenous bases. There's the adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Uh, so it's a four letter alphabet. But the sequence of those letters in the DNA molecule, as you go along the DNA uh, uh, molecule, that sequence is what results in the amino acid sequence or protein. In other words, the sequence in DNA codes for the sequence in uh, the amino acids. So the genome. Uh, what is a genome? The genome, uh, this is all of the DNA contained in one complete set of chromosomes. Uh, and this is found to be about 3.1 billion nucleotide pairs in the human genome. Uh, so, so what? Well, what do we need to do with that? First of all, we need to explain what the genome is and how this might relate to uh, the health sciences. Well, the, the so what? Why did it matter if we know? Uh, how many genes we have or what they are. Uh, in humans, we have 46 chromosomes. We have two complete sets. One set came from mom, one came from dad, or one is paternal, one is maternal. Uh, the Human Genome Project was completed in 2003 after 13 years of work. And this uh, allowed us to identify 99% of the human genome and opened up a field of study called genomics. Uh, so. Uh, this genomics here is a study of a whole genome and how its genes and non-coding DNA interact to affect structure and function of the whole organism. Uh, so what were the findings of the genome project? Uh, for us humans, uh, we now know there's fewer than 100,000 genes. That was an estimate uh, before the genome project was undertaken. Uh, so that means that a single gene must code for uh, different proteins. A gene averages about 13 base pairs long, uh, but can be as high as 2.4 million. Uh, all humans, at, at least 99%, uh, are at least 99% genetically identical, uh, but still, uh, there's great variation seen among humans. There's even variation seen among siblings. Uh, so, any two individuals can differ by more than 3 million base pairs, 
And this is due to combinations of single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, and what that means is a single nucleotide, this would be like any one of the nucleotides along the DNA can vary from one individual to another uh, in one of four possibilities, whether it's an A, a T, a C, or a G. And then if you have multiple ones like that, that can result, start resulting in uh, more and more variation. Okay. Um, some chromosomes were found to be gene rich while others are gene poor. So uh, one particular chromosome may have thousands of genes on there and another chromosome may have a few hundred. Um, they also have located uh, with this project uh, the locations of 1,400 disease producing mutations which has opened up the possibility to genomic medicine. Uh, millions of different proteins are referred to as the proteome. So all of it's like kind of the genome, all of our genes, well, which you can find within a given cell, uh, do produce a lot of proteins. So all of the possible proteins that are produced are referred to as the proteome. And this proteome uh, is made from just 20 different amino acids. And this is encoded by genes made of just four nucleotides. So how do we get from the gene and DNA to uh, a protein? Well, we have something called the genetic code. Okay? So what we want to do is define what that is and describe how DNA codes for a protein structure. So what is the genetic code? It's a system that enables the four nucleotides to code for amino acid sequences of all proteins. Okay. The minimum code here must be three nucleotides for, per amino acid for 20. This is because if we just took um, and made a one letter code, so every, every nucleotide, every, which will have one, one of the possible bases, uh, a nucleotide could possibly have an A, for adenine, a T for thiamine, a G for cytosine, uh, I mean guanine, or a C for cytosine. So that's one of four possibilities. So that would be four possibilities. It can only code for four amino acids. So we made it a two letter code. Then that's four more possibilities because that's uh, all of those same letters again. So in the very next spot on the DNA molecule, we can have four possibilities there an A, a C, a T, or a G. And when we do that, well, then how many different combinations are there? The way we could figure that out is by uh, taking the product of the two numbers. So four times four, 16. So there's only 16 possibilities and we can spend time working that out, but um, uh, trust me, it's, it's gonna be just 16 possible combinations, which is not enough to cover the 20 amino acids. So we're gonna need one more, a minimum of one more. So that's why we have need a three nucleotide code sequence again and so when we went, if we were to go through and work that out, what are all the possible combinations? The very first one could be AAA, then we could have AAA, AAT, AAG, and then start varying every one of those. That'll end up giving us 64 possible combinations, which is more than enough to cover, um, uh, to cover those 20 amino acids. So this is what the genetic code looks like. And when we look at it, we can see these three letter codes within the table there. There's one of the first ones in the table. Uh, here's another one. And right away you can see that there's U's in this code. So that must mean that the code is not found in DNA because you cannot find U in DNA. Uh, this code is within the mRNA. So basically what's going to happen here, we're going to see this in a bit, the DNA sequence is going to be used to make an RNA sequence. And then that RNA basically is carrying the code from DNA will then be used to produce a protein. Okay. So if you were to get a three letter code UUU, then it would give you this amino acid phenylalanine. If you were to get CCU, then this would give you another amino acid called proline. And here you just have your, your three letter abbreviations for uh, the 20 different amino acids. Now you can see here, if we were to look at all the possible uh, combinations you can get and we added them all up, there's going to be 64 codes in there. We're gonna see three of them are for stop. They tell us to stop making a protein. And one of them, AUG, is the start codon. And it codes for one specific amino acid called methionine. So we're gonna to refer to the three, uh, uh, three letter sequences in the DNA as the triplet or a base triplet. 
And this base triplet then would correspond to a three letter code on the mRNA called a codon. So basically it's the triplet that determines the codon and then the next triplet on the DNA determines the next codon. And then like I mentioned earlier, there are 64 possible codons which represent 20 amino acids. 61 of those codes are for amino acids, three are stop codons, I pointed those out, and then there is the start codon, the AUG. Make sure you know that one, it's AUG, and it codes for the MET amino acid, which is short uh, abbreviation for uh, methionine. Okay, so now we're gonna look at how proteins are actually made. <clears throat> um, so this ELO uh, is to describe the assembly of amino acids into protein which is called protein synthesis. Uh, so most of your body cells are going to contain identical genes. So every cell has same types of chromosomes, same set of genes. Uh, but how do we make one cell different from another? The answer is to activate certain genes in some cells and deactivate other, other genes within that same cell. So this allows us to have uh, blood cells, have uh, liver cells, have bone cells. They all have the same sets of genes, just certain genes are turned on, which is what makes each of those cells different. So when a gene is activated, uh, messenger RNA is made. Uh, mRNA is going to be complementary to a gene, and it'll migrate from the nucleus to the ribosome and the cytoplasm, uh, which makes sense because you're going to use DNA. Uh, DNA is found in the nucleus, so the mRNA has to be made in the, in the nucleus. This is the basic process here uh, of protein synthesis. We're going to start with a segment of DNA, your gene, and then that gene is, uh, or that gene is going to be used to produce mRNA, and then the mRNA will go to the cytoplasm and then, with the help of ribosomes, produce a protein. Uh, the first part, or the first process, is called transcription. This is where DNA codes for mRNA, and this occurs in the nucleus. So uh, this right here is transcription. And the second process of going from mRNA to a protein is called translation, which occurs in the cytoplasm. Uh, so transcription definition is copying genetic instructions from DNA to mRNA. Synthesis of messenger RNA is called transcription. Transcription begins when RNA polymerase recognizes and binds to the promoter region on the double-stranded DNA molecule. A particular subunit of the messenger RNA, called the sigma factor, participates in recognition of the promoter region. Soon after transcription is initiated, the sigma factor dissociates from the RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase moves along the template strand of the DNA, synthesizing the complementary single-stranded messenger RNA molecule. Synthesis is in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, with new nucleotides being added to the 3' prime end of the growing messenger RNA molecule. As the RNA polymerase advances along the DNA, it melts a new stretch of DNA and allows the previous stretch to close. When RNA polymerase reaches a specific sequence of nucleotides on the DNA called the transcription terminator, a hairpin loop structure forms in the messenger RNA, causing the RNA polymerase and the messenger RNA to dissociate from the DNA. Uh, this involves an enzyme called RNA polymerase. Uh, the enzyme is going to bind to DNA and help assemble the mRNA. And it's the, the RNA polymerase is going to find a special segment on the DNA at the start of the gene that has a sequence of thiamine, adenine, thiamine, adenine, thiamine, adenine, sometimes called the Tata box. Uh, and so what the RNA polymerase is going to do is opens the DNA helix, reads the bases from one strand of DNA. And then it's going to make a corresponding mRNA, uh, single-stranded molecule, where the RNA polymerase finds a C on the DNA, it'll add a G, which is a complement to it. Where it finds a G, it'll add a C, and where a T, 
on the DNA, the uh, RNA polymerase will find an, or, or will add an A to the mRNA. But whenever the RNA polymerase finds an A in the DNA, it adds a U to the mRNA. This is because, remember, we cannot find T on the RNA. So we can't put a T there because we're trying to make RNA. Uh, so the uh, parts of uh, regarding transcription, the RNA polymerase is going to rewind the DNA double helix behind it. Uh, and the gene can be transcribed by several uh, polymerase molecules at once. And then there's a terminator. This is a base sequence at the end of the gene signaling to stop. What we're going to end up getting there in the nucleus is something called a pre-mRNA. It's not really ready uh, to go to the cytoplasm and make a gene. Um, it's going to be made of uh, segments in it. So the, the, now we're talking about the mRNA. It's going to be made of segments of exons and introns. So an exon is going to be the sense portion of the pre-mRNA that will end up being uh, sent out of the nucleus uh, to build a protein. The introns are going to be nonsense portions which are going to be removed or cut out uh, before it goes into the cytoplasm for translation. There's going to be enzymes in the nucleus that remove the introns from the RNA and then stick the remaining pieces together. Uh, and here's where the mechanism for how we can get one gene to make multiple proteins. This is the process is referred to as alternative splicing. And here variations in the way exons are spliced and introns are removed, it's going to allow a variety of proteins to be produced from one gene. So we might take out certain segments uh, to make one type of protein, or we might take out other segments uh, to make a, uh, another kind of protein. This is illustrated here in uh, this uh, diagram here. Here we start with DNA and the process of transcription. All of this from here to here, uh, including the splicing, is going to occur in the nucleus and then once the actual mRNA goes out into the cytoplasm and we'll have translation occur so this would occur right here in the cytoplasm so here we start with our DNA molecule the RNA polymerase would work to make the transcript here's our pre mRNA we can see segments labeled with letters just to represent them those segments that are going to be used to make a protein are called exons, those are going to be cut out are called introns. But you can see here during our alternative splicing we can splice different segments of the sense uh, the sense part of the strand to make different mRNA molecules. In this illustration we have three uh, different mRNAs made from that one pre-mRNA which was made from one specific gene. So just with one gene in this illustration we can end up getting three different uh, segments or three different mRNAs that have different sequences on there which would code for three different proteins. There's protein one, protein two, and protein three because we ended up with uh, three different mRNA molecules. Uh, translation, this is the process that converts the language of nucleotides into the language of amino acids, kind of like translating from uh, one language to another. Prokaryotic cells, translation is initiated by formation of an initiation complex consisting of the 30S ribosomal subunit, formal methionyl tRNA, and messenger RNA. The 50S ribosomal subunit then joins the complex. Proteins called initiation factors are also involved but are not shown. The 70S ribosome has two sites to which transfer RNA carrying amino acids can bind. One is called the peptidyl, or P-site, and the other is called the acceptor, or A-site. There is also a third site called the exit, or E-site, where transfer RNAs are released. The initiating transfer RNA carrying formal methionine binds to the P-site. A transfer RNA that recognizes the next codon and carries the second amino acid then moves into the A-site. The formal methionine carried by the transfer RNA in the P-site is then joined to the amino acid carried by the transfer RNA that just entered the A-site by a peptide bond. The ribosome now advances a distance of one codon and the transfer RNA that carried the formal methionine is released at the E-site. A transfer RNA carrying the next amino acid now moves into the A site where the anticodon on the transfer RNA 
matches the codon on the messenger RNA. The ribosome shifts down by a distance of one codon. As the shift occurs, the two amino acids on the transfer RNA in the P site are transferred to the new amino acid, and the second transfer RNA is released from the E site. The ribosome continues to move along the messenger RNA, and new amino acids are added to the growing polypeptide chain. Elongation of the polypeptide is terminated when a stop codon moves into the A site. A stop codon does not specify an amino acid and does not have a corresponding transfer RNA. The ribosome dissociates into the 30S and 50S subunits and the messenger RNA and protein are released. There's three main participants in translation. One is the mRNA we talked about earlier, which is going to carry the code to the cytoplasm. And it's going to have a little protein cap on it, the mRNA, that uh, will be recognized by a ribosome. We're going to have transfer RNA, which delivers single amino acids to the ribosome for it uh, so that we can uh, continue to add a growing uh, protein chain. These transfer RNAs are going to have something called an anticodon on there, which is a complement to the codon on the mRNA. Uh, and it's a series of three nucleotides that are a uh, complement to the codon on the mRNA. And then we have ribosomes. And the ribosomes are organelles that read the message. Uh, these ribosomes can be found in the cytosol. It's free. They can be on the rough ER or right outside the nuclear envelope, uh, ready to capture the mRNAs. They're going to consist of large and small subunits, and each subunit is made of several enzymes plus rRNA, or ribosomal RNA. <clears throat> the mRNA molecule begins with a leader sequence, which is going to act as a building site for the small uh, uh, ribosomal uh, subunit, or binding site. So the, the small subunit will find the leader sequence. Then the large subunit attaches to the small subunit uh, once that occurs. The ribosome then pulls the mRNA molecule through it like a ribbon, reading the bases as it goes along. When the start codon, which is AUG, is reached, the protein synthesis will actually begin. And all proteins are going to begin with methionine. That AUG codes for uh, the methionine. This is a diagram of the transfer RNA. It's basically a molecule folded uh, molecule of, of RNA. Um, and it's going to have the anticodon, which you can see right here. So this is that uh, little, little segment right there that will correspond to a codon on the mRNA. The other end is going to have a binding site. So here on the other end is our binding site, which binds two specific amino acids. The amino acid it binds to depends on, on the properties of that TNR molecule and also is associated with a certain anticodon. Now, Every time we're going to bind a new amino acid, it's going to cost some energy, so we're going to need to use one ATP molecule to get an amino acid to attach uh, there at the end. Uh, there's going to be three steps to translation. There is initiation, elongation, and termination. In initiation, the leader sequence in the mRNA binds to the small ribosomal subunit. The initiator tRNA, which has the methionine, is going to pair with that start codon. And then the large ribosomal subunit joins the complex and the now fully formed ribosome begins reading the bases. We're going to look at the entire process at this point uh, and then we'll come back and look at the specifics of elongation and termination. We're going to go ahead and look at initiation and then look at an illustration of the, of the rest of the parts and then we'll come back to uh, some specific highlights. So here's the process right here. We have an initiation taking place here where the small ribosomal subunit is going to bind to uh, the location on the, uh, on the uh, mRNA. And then we're going to have our initiator tRNA bringing in that amino acid. And then here we see in the next part, the large subunit will join in making the incomplete, making the complete uh, ribosome. And then in this step here, uh, the anticodon of the incoming tRNA pairs with the next mRNA code.
code on besides the initiator. So here basically we're going to have another tRNA coming into the very next spot here. Then in the next step here, the amino acid on the initiator tRNA forms a peptide bond with the amino acid beside it. So there we're going to now form a peptide bond right here, which is the specific kind of covalent bond between the amino acids. Now then the mRNA is moving. It's going to move along uh, or be pulled through the uh, ribosome. And the initiator tRNA is going to leave the ribosome. So there it's leaving and it'll go into uh, the cytoplasm, grab another methionine. Uh, so uh, basically this process is going to be repeated. So we're going to go step three, four, and five again as the ribosome is pulling through and the next codon is read. So based on what the next codon is going to be, the next three letters, we're going to bring in another uh, tRNA that's complement to that. And that tRNA will bring in a specific amino acid. Um, then the protein synthesis is going to stop when the ribosome reaches the stop one of the three stop codons. Uh, so, and once that happens, the ribosome uh, will break apart into its largest and small subunits, and the polypeptide chain, which is not really an active protein yet, will uh, break off into the cytoplasm. So here are the specifics of that elongation part. Uh, so we already went through initiation, the ribosome. Um, has completely formed and is now beginning to pull the, the mRNA through. So here the next tRNA is going to bind to ribosomes while it's anticodon pair with the next codon of the mRNA. Uh, the peptide bond forms between methionine and the second amino acid and the ribosome slides to read the next codon and releases the initiator tRNA. The uh, initiator tRNA has, doesn't have the amino acid on anymore. The next tRNA with the appropriate anticodon brings its amino acid to the ribosome and another peptide bond forms between the second and third amino acids. So this process is going to repeat as the protein uh, chain begins to elongate or extend. And then we have termination. When the ribosome reaches the stop codon, the release factor binds to it. The finished protein breaks away from the ribosome and the ribosome dissociates into two subunits. Um, thing about uh, this translation is that uh, it can be very rapid for uh, a few reasons. First of all, we have uh, a condition called polyribosome, and this is going to be where um, one mRNA attaches to multiple ribosomes, uh, maybe 20 to 30. And so this is an electron micrograph showing all of these uh, circular spherical objects are all ribosomes. So they're all basically uh, uh, translating all at the same time. So each one of them is producing a, a polypeptide chain. So a cell may have uh, 30,000 identical mRNAs all undergoing simultaneous translation. So you have 30,000 mRNAs, each one with 10 to 20 ribosomes that can produce 100,000 protein molecules per second. So it can be pretty fast because all of that stuff is occurring all at the same time. This diagram is given in your notes basically illustrate this process, uh, but I included some animations that we have looked at that uh, kind of show this process. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's just a different representation of the same. Um, process. So we study here, study there, and make the connections between all of them. They all represent the same thing or the same process. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out on this one here is that if we are going to have a free protein made in the cytosol, then it would, uh, it would be uh, translated on a free ribosome. However, this is a protein that is destined to be secreted by exocytosis or uh, for whatever reason, we need to keep the protein that's being produced separate from the rest of the cytoplasm out here. Uh, we're going to have the uh, ribosome with its mRNA come and uh, join up with the ER. So this will be the rough ER. And as the translation is occurring, the, the growing peptide chain falls within the, within the cavity or the cisterna of the uh, ER. And that way it keeps the product separate from the rest of the cytosome. 
So we'll talk about that again uh, a little bit more, a little bit more detail in a little bit. And so after that translation, some proteins are going to be packaged and some are exported, which I was what I was uh, just talking about. Proteins headed for lysosomes or for secretion are going to be made on the ribosomes on the rough ER. The newly made ribosome is going to be threaded into the rough ER where it is modified and packaged into a transport vesicle. Um, so this is kind of an overview of or a summary of the process we just looked at. So here we're going to have our DNA molecule. One of the strands of the DNA is represented here and here we're only going to have seven base triplets just to simplify things. We're not going to look at a whole bunch of triplets uh, for an actual protein, just to kind of simple, make things simple to understand the general idea. So when we go from here to this stage right here, we're now making our mRNA. That process is going to be transcription. So these triplets are complementary to the codons that end up being produced. So these are the codons. So this is the mRNA. Uh, so this is our DNA. This is going to be our mRNA. Our, our mature mRNA after the introns have been cut out. And so you can see the codons along there. That sequence of codons will determine the sequence of amino acids. And these codons are complementary to the anticodons on the tRNA. So these are the tRNAs. What's left out of this diagram is the ribosomes. The ribosomes, remember, are, are uh, an important role in helping to read and assemble the different amino acids as they come in. But if we look at that uh, genetic code from earlier, okay, and we look at the first one, AUG, that's going to correspond to the anticode on UAC, but we go and we look it up. So we look up, there's the A in the first letter, here's the U, so we know it's going to be in the first column, and then there's the G, so there are, is our first codon, it should be methionine, and sure enough, we got methionine being brought in. Then our next codon right here is GCG. So we look for G in the first letter. Okay. And then C, so we know it's going to be here in this column here. So GCG, we should be getting an alanine. And sure enough, there is our alanine that's being brought in. And then we can keep going through this, the GGA, there's the G. There's the second letter G and then the A would be over here. So there's our GGA, we should be getting glycine. So these codons you can see off the genetic code are bringing in these appropriate amino acids. And the peptide bonds are formed and then we have our peptide chain there. So uh, once we've made the polypeptide, it's still not a functioning protein. It's got to be folded uh, properly. Okay, so uh, we're not finished yet. So we've, what we've done is we've made the primary structure, which is the sequence of amino acids. But we've got to fold it. So we've got to fold it by a secondary, uh, uh, to a secondary structure and then fold it further into a tertiary structure. These topics were covered in Chapter 2 when we were covering some of the biochemistry in there. Um, there are special proteins called chaperone proteins, uh, which are going to be other proteins present which are going to pick up these peptide chains and then guide their folding. Uh, and what this does is it's going to help prevent, um, help prevent improper association between different proteins. So we don't want different uh, polypeptide chains interacting with each other. And then we have some of them called stress proteins or heat shock proteins. These are going to be special chaperones uh, that are going to be produced in response to heat or stress. And what they do is they help damaged proteins fold back into correct into their correct functional shape. Uh, and that's so those, those specific chaperones are produced during those uh, stressful times. Uh, and so what this slide does is it helps us uh, in order to explain what happens to a protein after the amino acid sequence has been synthesized. Well, we've, we've got to fold it properly. And then we gotta make sure it's folded properly so that it functions correctly. Otherwise the protein won't function correctly. Uh, this is just a little diagram showing this is our chaperone protein right here, okay? And uh, so now we're gonna make it real cartoon-like or diagrammatic-like. So here comes our, our polypeptide chain. It goes into the chaperone protein. A little cap or a second piece of that chaperone protein 
joins on there, changes the shape of the entire thing. And then when, while it's closed in there, the polypeptide chain uh, is, going, is going to go through the process of being folded correctly. Once it's folded correctly, then it is released from the, uh, from the chaperone protein and, and then it goes on to whatever, doing whatever function it has uh, within the cytoplasm or other parts of the cell. Um, so let's kind of take a look at this diagram here. Um, what happens when we have to make a protein that remains has to remain separate from the cytoplasm? Well, first thing we want to do is have the ribosome come up and bond with a rough ER, and so then that that pro or that peptide chain gets threaded into the the cavity or the, within the ER the, called the cisterna, and then here. Uh, as it's in there, it'll go through some modifications, the peptide will, and then eventually it'll be packaged into this uh, transport vesicle. Um, and that transport vesicle, as it is freed from the ER, may join with other transport vesicles uh, to form these clusters. Okay? Now these clusters will then arrive at the uh, Golgi complex and spill their contents in there. And the Golgi complex then is going to modify further modify that structure. Eventually, when we get to the far side of the Golgi complex, the, the side furthest away from the ER, uh, it'll form another transport vesicle. And these transport vesicles right here uh, can go to the cytoplasm. And from there, they may uh, be excreted by a process called exocytosis. Or in the case of lys lysosome formation, the lysosome itself, digestive enzymes were produced, so we want to keep it separate within this vesicle uh, called a lysosome because we don't want those digestive enzymes digesting other parts of the cell. Uh, these are going to remain in there to digest old cell parts or any food taken in by, by the cell itself. Um, <clears throat> so the proteins that are going to be used in the cytosol are going to be made on free ribosomes. But proteins that are going to be packaged into lysosomes or for secretion are going to be assembled on the rough ER and then eventually sent to the Golgi complex for packaging. So an entire polyribosome might migrate to the rough ER and dock on its surface. Then the assembled amino acid chain will be completed on the rough ER and then from there it will be sent for, to the Golgi complex for final modification. Proteins assembled on the ER surface are going to be uh, threaded uh, through a pore in the ER and then fall into the cisterna, which is the hollow space within the ER. The ER modifies the protein by post-translational modification. That's just fancy for after translation when we first make our peptide chain. What kind of modifications can occur? We might remove amino acid segments. Okay? We might fold the protein while we're in there. We might add certain uh, bonding within the peptide chain called disulfide bridges, which will stabilize it. Or we might add some carbohydrates to the peptide chain. Now when the rough ER is finished with the protein, it's going to pinch off a bubble-like bubble transport vesicle, and it's going to coat it with a special protein called clathrin. Uh, the clathrin is going to help the, or the clathrin helps select the proteins to be transported in the vesicles and helps mold the vesicle itself. So this clathrin here is actually an important part of forming that vesicle uh, correctly. Then the vesicle is going to detach from the ER and carry the protein to the nearest cisterna of the Golgi complex. So the cisterna is also found in the Golgi complex. It's just a term for the hollow area within the Golgi complex. The vesicles are then going to fuse, just like in the diagram we were looking at earlier. They're going, to, they're going to fuse and unload the protein in the Golgi cisterna. And then the complex further modifies the protein. It's often going to add carbohydrate chains, which would make uh, glycoproteins. Uh, then the Golgi cisterna furthest from the ER is going to butt off a new coated, uh, coated with the clathrin protein vesicles, which are going to contain the finished uh, protein. Uh, some of those Golgi vesicles are going to become those lysosomes, which are those organelles for digestion. Other Golgi vesicles are going to become the secretory vesicles, 
and they're going to migrate to the plasma membrane, fuse to it, and release their product by a process called exocytosis. Okay, so now our goal is to describe ways a gene can be turned on or off, since not all genes are on all the time. Um, we want to examine at least one case, how that might occur. Uh, so as an example, how can we turn on or off a gene? We can turn them off permanently or uh, as the cell needs uh, certain genes turned on or turned off. The example here would be a liver cell. We're going to turn off genes for hemoglobin since hemoglobin is found in red blood cells for carrying oxygen. That's not the job of a liver cell, so why go through the, the trouble of making hemoglobin if you're not going to use it if you're a liver cell? Uh, so we'd want to turn that off. Now cells can turn genes on only when they're needed. And the level of gene expression, um, so the level of gene expression within a cell can vary from day to day or hour to hour depending on the needs of the cell. And we can control this by chemical messengers called hormones. An example we're going to go through is the mammary gland cells, the cells that produce milk. They produce a protein of milk called casein. And so we're going to explore that, uh, that particular model for gene control. So here's a diagram showing it. The name of the hormone that's released is called prolactin. Okay. Prolactin will be sent throughout all of the body uh, when it's needed. And it'll go through, uh, through, through your bloodstream. And it'll eventually find the cells in the mammary glands that have a very, very specific receptor. For prolactin. I'm not just going to go to any uh, protein receptor in the membrane. It's going to go to a specific one. So once that does, once it binds very specifically the prolactin to the receptor, it's going to send a message inside. So the prolactin can't enter into the membrane, but it will send its message in there. So what that's going to do is it's going to activate a regulatory protein, which we see right here. So here's our, our regulatory protein. Uh, right here and right now it's inactive but if we were to add a phosphate which came from ATP so we add a phosphate to it which again the message from prolactin is giving instructions to the cell uh, through a series of reactions to turn on this regulatory protein okay and this regulatory protein is actually a transcription activator which is going to get transcription to occur remember transcription is when we're going to take DNA and make an mRNA transcript so now that this regulatory protein is turned on, it's going to go into the nucleus. It's going to find the correct gene for a casein. And when it binds to the, to the initiating site there, it'll allow the RNA polymerase to come in and bond at the right spot. Uh, once it does that, then we're going to transcribe and make the mRNA. So the mRNA for casein will be produced here in the nucleus, like we learned a while ago. And then that mRNA, the mature mRNA, will go out. And since we don't want the casein protein to be made and produced freely within uh, the cytoplasm, the uh, mRNA is going to go to the rough endoplasmic reticulum uh, where it will be translated. So then the peptide chain will be threaded into the cisterna of the rough ER. And then within the ER, it'll be modified. And then we'll produce these transport vesicles which will join together, as we saw earlier. Eventually, these are going to fuse into the Golgi complex. Within the Golgi complex, go through further modifications, and then we produce a final transport vesicle. These particular transport vesicles are going to be called secretory vesicles because they're going to do a process of secretion. So eventually, these secretory vesicles will come to the membrane and then spill out their contents into the milk to help make the milk. And this process is called exocytosis. These are uh, the steps uh, for casein synthesis earlier with some of those keywords highlighted. We have the word hormone, which is called prolactin with a very specific receptor on the membrane. The receptor is going to trigger an activation of the regulatory protein, which we saw labeled on the diagram earlier, called a transcription activator. And it's in the cytoplasm. The regulatory protein is then going to move into the nucleus to the DNA near the casein gene. 
the binding enables RNA polymerase to bind to the gene and transcribe it. And this will produce the mRNA for casein. The casein mRNA then moves to the cytoplasm and ribosomes on the rough ER to translate it. The Golgi complex then packages the casein into secretory vesicles and the secretory vesicles release the casein by exocytosis which will become the casein will become part of the milk. Uh, so now we have this other idea here where we know DNA makes proteins but what does DNA have to do with making things that are not proteins like how do we make certain carbohydrates how do we produce certain lipids or, or fats how do we produce those if DNA only makes proteins so how could we possibly synthesize those other things well, the correct answer would be indirectly. So this is our final objective for the section right here. And it says, explain how DNA indirectly regulates the synthesis of non-protein molecules. Uh, so for example, our cells are gonna synthesize non-protein products like glycogen, fat steroids, phospholipids, pigments, and other compounds. And there's no genes that are specific for these because they're not proteins. Uh, but what, what actually does it is the indirect control by a gene. So we don't have a gene to make glycogen, but we have an in, a gene to make an enzyme. So those enzymes are then the ones that will go and produce those compounds. So the enzymes are going, which are made of proteins and created by genes or coded for by genes those enzymes then go and produce these non-protein molecules. So that's, that's a key idea there. An example here is with testosterone, which is a steroid. So a cell of the testes where testosterone is produced is gonna take in cholesterol and then enzymatically, with the help of an enzyme, which was coded for by a gene, is going to convert the cholesterol to testosterone. Uh, and so this is only gonna happen if the gene for the enzyme is active. So we have flipped on the, on the gene, turned on the gene for the enzyme, which converts uh, cholesterol to testosterone. Uh, so this is fascinating, the indirect uh, control of, of producing those non-protein molecules. But what's even more fascinating is that these genes can have uh, such a great effect uh, on other things that uh, just are not directly related uh, to making proteins. And for example here, uh, the genes that are responsible for producing testosterone also produce some complex behaviors like aggression and sex drive. So all of those things are kind of fascinating and interesting areas of, uh, of research. Uh, 